advertise it throughout the camp, camp, uh, campus. And many of our students work, so they can't just spend the whole day here. So anyway, let us go on to the next person, Elizabeth Cohen. Elizabeth Cohen is a very well-known name in American history. She's at Harvard University. She has a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. And she has written two books. And here they are. She's written more than this, but hey, this is, this is major stuff. Um, she is a Jersey girl, born in Paramus, lived in Montclair. What else can I say? <laughs> she writes on popular culture, urban, social, and political history. And she has won many research fellowships. The thing with Liz is that her articles translate into books. There is an, a chapter in here solely on the Paramus Walls. Her whole book is, is all New Jersey. But that chapter was originally an article which I used in my historical methods class. The students read an article on New Jersey, and they went berserk. They had never read a scholarly article on New Jersey. I used that article in every class, and then when we started our, urban, um, our grad program with urban history, I had a class in urban New Jersey. I used that article again. Again, it had, you know, met raves. When the book came out, guess what? I made him read the book. So I have this little connection. She has helped me in my classes. <laughs> and thank you very much. And let me introduce to you Elizabeth Cohen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for such a warm welcome and the hospitality that's been shown to me, and particularly to thank Anne Siliberti and Dewar McLeod, who, with whom I've been uh, in communication to planning this. I went back to the original email since I think last March or April, so um, it's amazing that here we are. But time has come. Um, can you hear me okay? I think I'm wired on this one, so I don't need to worry about this make sure you can hear. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be back in New Jersey, um, as you heard, the land of my birth. And actually, this weekend has been very um, inspiring in a nostalgic way for me in that I hit three out of the four places I've spent time um, in my life. Uh, I was in, I've been, stayed last night in Paramus. Uh, we went for dinner in Montclair. And I spent the weekend uh, in Princeton, uh, where I'd been an undergraduate and where my daughter is now a freshman. So the only place I missed was River Edge, where I also spent some time. So I'll have to get there at some point. And New Jersey is also the site of uh, much of the research for this recently published book, A Consumer's Republic, The Politics of Mass Consumption in Post-War America. And it's a setting for much of the book's action. Uh, I use New Jersey to root my investigation into what I call the landscape of mass consumption, the new kind of residential communities and commercial spaces that emerged, in many cases exploded, during the post-World War II era. Because New Jersey has in so many ways epitomized the quintessential post-war suburban experience, it proved rich ground for my study. Despite a population growth of almost two million, between 1940 and 1960, what amounted to a 50% growth, a 50% increase over two decades. Every major city except Patterson lost population. And Patterson gained a mere 4,000 residents due to an unusually large in-migration of a low-income population with large families, which served to offset the city's still significant out-migration of long-time residents with higher incomes. In time, 70% of the state's total area would qualify as suburban. 
And by the turn of the 21st century, New Jersey and Connecticut shared the distinction of being the nation's most suburbanized states. On a more personal note, focusing on New Jersey helped me to understand better the formative influences on my own life as I spent my first decade living in, sub in a suburban tract house, in, it, actually two of them, in Bergen County, a few minutes away from where the new shopping centers of Paramus sprouted. I returned to New Jersey for college, and many years later, when I was teaching at NYU, I moved to Montclair in Essex County with my own children and experienced uh, New Jersey as an adult resident, taxpayer, voter, and parent. That post-war New Jersey has figured so prominently in my own life has given me both a strong motivation to understand it and a rich memory bank to call upon in the process. Um, now, I'm going to illustrate this talk uh, with illustrations from my book. There are a lot of illustrations in it. I've been selective here. And I should also say at this point that in what I'm going to talk about today, I'm only touching on a small number of the themes that the book deals with. There's a lot more on uh, the 1930s and World War II, on post-war advertising, on political campaigning, and consumer mobilizations, among other themes. I'd like to begin by establishing two points. First, that a dramatic and multi-dimensional shift indeed occurred after World War II, the establishment of a new order that I have entitled uh, the Consumer's Republic, and second, that it had particular consequences for the, sh for the physical shape of post-war metropolises. The United States came out of World War II deeply determined to prolong and enhance the economic recovery that had been brought on by the war, lest the crippling depression of the 1930s return. During wartime, a mass production war machine operating at full throttle to produce the material for, for battle had already provided many new jobs and filled many empty pockets and bank accounts. New Jersey's shipyards, petroleum refineries, and diverse manufacturing base in particular had stocked the military's warehouses for radio and radar, ships, munitions, uniforms, chemicals, food, airplane engines, and much more. By war's end, little New Jersey would rank fifth in the nation in war contracts. In New Jersey and elsewhere, ensuring a prosperous peacetime would require making new kinds of products and selling them to different kinds of markets. Although, although military production would persist and would expand greatly with the Cold War, its critical partner in delivering prosperity was the mass consumer market. A wide range of economic interests and players, including strident anti-New Deal big businessmen, moderate and liberal capitalists, labor and its allies on the left, and government officials, all came to endorse the centrality of mass consumption to a successful reconversion from war to peace. In some ways, this was the same Keynesian scheme that the New Dealers had seized upon to pull them out of the Great Depression in the, 19, the late 1930s. But the experience of war had turned promising strategy to proven reality. Factory assembly lines, newly renovated with Uncle Sam's dollars, stood awaiting conversion from building tanks and munitions to producing cars and appliances for sale to consumers. This is a, a cartoon from Collier's Magazine by Vic Herman, and I show it to you to capture the, the importance of the shift in production from armaments to consumer durables. If encouraging a mass consumer economy seemed to make good economic sense for the nation, it still required extensive efforts to get Americans to cooperate. Certainly, there, were there was a tremendous pent-up demand for goods, housing, and almost everything else after a decade and a half of wrenching depression and war. But consumers were also cautious about spending the savings and war bonds that they had gladly accumulated while consumption was restricted on the home front. Hence, beginning during the war and with great fervor after it, businesses, labor unions, government agencies, the mass media, advertisers, and many other purveyors of the new post-war order conveyed the message that mass consumption was not a personal indulgence. Rather, it was a civic responsibility designed to improve the living standards of all Americans, 
a critical part of a prosperity-producing cycle of expanded consumer demand fueling greater production, thereby creating more well-paying jobs and in turn more affluent consumers capable of stoking the economy with their purchases. And I show you here an illustration from New Deal economist Robert Nathan's book, Mobilizing for Abundance, which was published in 1944, that gives you the, the, the blueprint, in a sense, for this post-war economy. And so you can see the centrality of the consumer and how purchases fuel this cycle, uh, consumer purchases fuel the cycle of prosperity. For its promoters, this mass consumption-driven economy held out the promise of political as well as economic democracy. Reconversion after World War II raised the hopes of Americans of many political persuasions and social positions that not only a more prosperous, but also a more equitable and democratic American society would finally be possible in the mid-20th century due to the enormous and war-proven capacities of mass production and mass consumption. As more Americans live better and on a more equal footing with their neighbors, it was expected, the dream of an egalitarian America would finally be achieved. Politicians never tired of tying America's political and economic su superiority over the Soviet Union to its more democratic distribution of goods. In 1959, at the American Trade Exhibition in Moscow, and this was the site of the famous kitchen debate between Khrushchev and Nixon, uh, Vice President Richard Nixon went so far as to tell the Russian people that all the homes, televisions, and radios that Americans owned brought them closer to the Marxist ideal of a classless society than the Soviets. The new post-war order deemed then that the good customer devoted to more, newer, and better was in fact the good citizen, responsible for making the United States a more desirable place for all its people. This is one of my favorite images and also a kind of icon, I think, uh, of the Consumers Republic. Now, as, and, and I have a, a, a quotation that I stumbled upon that it actually goes very well with this photograph. As Bride Magazine told the acquisitive readers of its handbook for newlyweds, um, quote, when you buy the dozens of things you never bought or even thought of before, you are helping to build greater security for the industries of this country. What you buy and how you buy it is very vital to your new life and to our whole American way of living, end quote. Wherever one looked in the aftermath of war, one found a vision of post-war America where the general good was best served not by frugality or even moderation, but by individuals pursuing personal wants in a flourishing mass consumption marketplace. This is an, um, a, a magazine illustration uh, here called Family Status. This is a, a photo essay, essay in Life magazine from 1946, focusing in on the Hemicky family and you see them go from before to after, before working class family in a fairly rundown house, the man is dressed as a blue collar worker, uh, and then they, on the other side now, he's, the father is dressed as a white collar worker, they're in, uh, supposedly in a, in a new ranch style house in a modern kitchen. It turns out actually that this was pretty much a staged photo essay, and that part is true, but here they're actually taking the hemicies to a, um, a, a new, somebody else's ranch-style home, and this is actually done in a demonstration kitchen in a local department store. But the message is that, uh, and the text brings this out, that, the, that it's in the, the, the movement of people like the Hemikis and the purchasing of new goods that all of Americans will ultimately prosper. Um, my, uh, private consumption and ma public benefit, it was widely argued, went hand in hand. And what made this strategy all the more attractive was the way it promised a socially progressive end of social equality without requiring politi politically progressive means of redistributing existing wealth. Rather, it was argued an ever-growing economy built around the twin dynamics of increased productivity and mass purchasing power would expand the overall pie without reducing the size of any of the portions. And these are illustrations from a book by Chester Bowles called Tomorrow Without Fear, which was published in 1946. Bowles was a very prominent advertising man who became head of the Office of Price Administration during World War II. 
and he uh, wrote this book as his kind of his plan for post-war America. And I show it to you to, to get across the idea of how this growing pie was going to benefit everybody, and nobody would have to sacrifice. So at the top, even the low, the lowest third starts off pretty poorly and doing a lot better um, when the pie grows. Even the middle third. Uh, starting off with an sort of ordinary white-collar worker's um, hat, ends up with a top hat as the pie grows, it's doing better. But in even the top third, um, who's got a pretty big share at first, gets a smaller share, but when the pie grows, uh, he benefits as well. When President Truman challenged Americans in 1950 to, quote, achieve a far better standard of living for every industrious family, end quote, within a decade, he characteristically reassured them that, and again I quote, raising the standards of our poorest families will not be at the expense of anybody else. We will all benefit from doing it, for the incomes of the rest of us will rise at the same time, end quote. For what, what I have called for convenience, a consumer's republic, and I should just point out that this is my phrase, not one that was used at the time, but I saw the concept articulated over and over again. Um, was particularly, uh, had, it had far-ranging implications for the physical character of post-war America, and in particularly was visible in a state like New Jersey. To begin with, new house construction provided the bedrock of the post-war mass consumption economy, both through turning home into an expensive commodity for purchase by many more consumers than ever before, and by stimulating demand for related commodities. As today, and anybody who's bought a house knows this, the purchase of a new single family home almost always obligated buyers to acquire new household appliances and furnishings. And if the house was in the suburbs, as over 80% were, at least one car as well. Just an image from 1950 to show you the importance of, of um, automobiles in the economy. The scale of new residential construction following World War II was unprecedented. And it was made possible by a mixed economy of private enterprise bolstered by government subsidy in the form of mortgage guarantees with low interest rates and no down payment directly to buyers as part of the veterans benefits under the GI Bill of Rights of 1944 and indirectly to buyers through loan insurance to lenders and developers through the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA. The federal government assisted as well through granting mortgage interest deductions on income taxes, and by World War II, the income tax had become a mass tax, and constructing highways from cities out to the farmland that overnight was being transformed into vast suburban tract developments. In New Jersey, single-family houses mushroomed from 7% of the, of the state's housing stock in 1950 to 64% a decade later. In the highly suburbanized northern New Jersey area, by 1960, a full quarter of the dwelling units had been built since 1950. In the words of one astute observer, the Garden State was fast becoming the backyard Garden State, as the housing subdivision became the New Jersey farmer's final crop. And this is a process that is still going on today, and I would just want to draw your attention to an article that was in yesterday's Sunday uh, New York Times magazine. Um, about the Tom Brothers um, uh, builders who are using whatever uh, open land still exists, buying that and putting up new developments of luxury homes uh, in this case. And I really recommend this article to you. It shows you how this process is still uh, very much going on. This promotion of private market solutions to boost the mass consumption economy, even if heavily subsidized by the federal government, turned a dire social need for shelter into an economic boom. The ground had already been set during wartime when consumers across the economic spectrum were encouraged to imagine home as a newly built single family detached house for purchase in the suburbs, not a rented residence in a multiple dwelling in the city. I'm just gonna show you a couple images. Um, okay, this is a... Um, uh, an ad for General Electric, um, and General Electric was convinced that its own post-war market would depend on the building and equipping of privately owned homes on a mass scale, and it ran advertisements like this in the popular press during World War II. This is from the Saturday Evening Post, June 5th, 1943, and the caption, I don't think you can probably read it, says, 
That little house sketched there in the sand is a, is a symbol of faith and hope and courage. It is a promise too, a promise of glorious happy days to come when victory is won. Um, and so, again, the image that's being presented of home is very much a, a suburban type house. As in New Jersey, one out of every four homes standing in the United States in 1960 went up in the 1950s. And as a result of this explosion in house construction, by the same year, 62% of Americans could claim that they owned their own homes, in contrast to only 44% as recently as 1940. And this is the biggest jump in home ownership rates ever recorded. Today, the rate is about 67%. So that's a jump of 18% in the in in 20 years from 1940 to 1960 and only about 5% in the 40 plus years from 1960 to the present. Now this is a photograph of my sister and me outside our new tract house in Paramus, New Jersey in 1956. I'm the big sister there on the left. Uh, my parents had moved to this house about a month before I was born in 1952. Uh, neither of my parents nor my, any of my grandparents had ever lived in a home they owned. And I, I point that out to just show how typical we were. Home building became so central a component of post-war prosperity, in fact, that beginning in 1959, the United States Census Bureau began calculating housing starts on a monthly basis as a key indicator of the economy's vitality. And this is a cover from Life Magazine, January 5th, 1953, the American and his economy, we'll, we'll, get, we'll talk in a few minutes about the gender aspect of that, uh, but the point I want to make is how central home building was considered to the economy. Family buys that $2,000 house there and you see the family. Um, the passage of time revealed, however, that despite the idealistic expectations that launched the Consumers Republic, private housing centrality to the mass consumption marketplace favored certain kinds of metropolitan locales as well as particular social groups over others. This is a very, a very typical scene of suburban tract houses going up. Dependence on new single family privately owned detached home construction to solve the enormous post-war housing crunch as well as to fuel the economy privileged suburbs over cities. As millions of Americans concluded it was cheaper and more desirable to own rather than to rent, they left older, often deteriorating housing in cities like New Jersey's Newark, Elizabeth, Patterson, Passaic, for the new suburban communities favored by the VA and FH loan program, and reinforced by lending practices of private banks. Between 1947 and 1953 alone, the suburban population increased by 43%, in contrast to a general population increase of only 11%. Over the course of the 1950s, in the nation's 20 largest metropolitan areas, cities would grow by only 0.1%, their suburbs by an explosive 45%. By 1965, a majority of Americans would make their homes in suburbs rather than cities. Today, Typical American metropolitan areas range in the proportion of their center city populations from the 20% of Boston to the 30% of New York, but overwhelmingly their populations are suburban. The home ownership at the heart of the Consumers Republic did more than expand the numbers and enhance the status of suburbanites over urbanites. In the process, it advantaged some kinds of people over other kinds. Through their greater access to home mortgages, to credit, and to tax advantages, men benefited over women, whites over blacks, and middle-class Americans over working-class ones. Men, for example, secured low VA mortgages and additional credit that home ownership made available as a result of their veteran status in World War II and the Korean War, while women generally did not. And this is uh, just a I, I want to show you this uh, ad from the 1950s for the Hartford Insurance Company where the man is very much the, 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 um, the, the person who's being spoken to here, he, and he is clearly the property owner. When it says property owner, take yourself off the spot, and the wife and children are pictured as almost part of his property. White Americans more easily qualified for mortgages, including those dispensed through the GI Bill, which worked through existing and consistently discriminatory banking institutions, 
and more readily found suburban homes to buy than African Americans could. I'm going to show you two photographs here, uh, the ideal and the reality, in a sense, of the GI Bill. Uh, this is the ideal. It shows a staff sergeant uh, explaining the GI Bill of Rights to a quartermaster trucking company in Italy. Uh, and the reality was often quite different. This is a, uh, these are posters being made by a black vet group, the, the Negro Allied Veterans of America. They're preparing for a demonstration to protest post-war conditions for black vets, and they're particularly concerned about the inadequate supply of decent housing. And when I went through the papers of the NAACP uh, in Washington, um, in the Library of Congress, I found many, many letters, including quite a number from New Jersey, from black vets complaining that they were not able to get the advantages that they thought that were coming to them from the GI Bill. And while some working class Americans did move to suburbs, increasingly they tended to, tended to settle in what were referred to as cops and firemen suburban towns, quite distinct from where successful professionals and entrepreneurs live. Studies of, by sociologists of Levittown, Long Island in 1950 and 1960 documented a shift away from a mixed class suburb to a more exclusively lower middle class one as white collar residents moved out of Levittown to more affluent communities nearby. Even when factories moved out of cities into suburban areas and were welcomed by communities eager for their property tax dollars, often their workers could not live there because of the unwillingness of these towns to approve the zoning changes that would have made them affordable. Case in point is the struggle around 1955 of the United Auto Workers Union to make housing available to its members working in Ford's new assembly plant in Mawa, New Jersey. When the United Auto Workers Housing Corporation, a subsidiary of the union, tried to build federally assisted housing within the price range of the 5,200 decently paid unionized workers, the town of Mawa refused to grant a variance to its exclusionary zoning code requiring two-acre lots. Likewise, when a large IBM installation was welcomed in another Bergen County town as a lucrative tax-paying rateable, the Garden Apartments sought to house employees met with the response, quote, there's lots of empty land and cheap housing further out. There's no reason why people should feel that they have to live in Franklin Lakes just because they work there, quote. The class sorting that took place in Levittown, Long Island and Bergen County, New Jersey was indicative of a metropolitan landscape where whole communities were increasingly being stratified along class and racial lines. As home, particularly a new one in the Consumers Republic, became a commodity to be traded up like a car, rather than an emotional investment in a neighborhood or a church parish, property values became the new mantra. Of course, people still chose the towns they lived in, but increasingly they selected among internally homogeneous suburban communities, occupying different rungs in a hierarchy of property values. Communities of new homes could most easily be pegged. When, you, when the annual income required to buy and retain a typical new home being built in the new middle class Morris County, New Jersey suburb of Parsippany Troy Hills, when that was, the, when the, uh, the um, annual income required was estimated at $12,000 in early 1960s, policemen and firemen in northern New Jersey earned about $8,000 a year, while only 17% of all Newark families and only 9% of non-white families earned over $9,000. Moreover, local zoning regulations enforcing plot and house size and prohibiting multiple dwellings in suburban towns contributed as well to the sorting out of prospective buyers by social class and implicitly by race. This is a page from the report of the National Commission on Urban Problems, which was entitled Building the American City. It was released in 1968, and it just states bluntly that residential communities have become stratified by social class. If you can read it, it says, quote, residential segregation by income class has been fostered by federal regulations, restrictive codes, and fiscal zoning. Developers catering to $50,000 to $100,000 homes as in this small plat with 29 swimming pools, can neglect the need for balanced communities." End quote. Not only did house prices position a community on that ladder of prestige, but so too did its racial profile. Many suburban whites leaving cities with growing African-American populations due to the linked trends of white flight and massive black migration north and west after World War II, 
felt that only an all-white community would ensure the safety of their investment, which was often their entire life savings. And they did everything within their power to restrict blacks' access to real estate in their own towns. When one cynical Newark public official in 19, what, what one cynical Newark public official uh, in 1962 labeled segregerbia flourished, he said, because, quote, the free ent enterprise system lurking in many American hearts has provided more moves to all white suburbs than the billion words of love have promoted the spiritual advantages of economic and integrated city living, end quote. And in fact, uh, in his city, in Newark, at that moment in time, 50,000 blue-collar residents, which was a third of the resident labor force in this increasingly working class, poor and black city of 400,000, left for jobs outside the city in towns where they could not afford to live or were not able to live for other reasons, while 200,000 white-collar workers commuted into corporate jobs in Newark from outlying middle and upper class suburbs. This is a little hard to see, but it's a, it's a street in Levittown, Pennsylvania, uh, in 1957, and it shows uh, crowds of neighbors who are uh, hanging around um, because they've been organizing uh, on a sustained basis a protest against the arrival of William and Daisy Myers, a black family, the first black family to move into any Levitt town. The house had been on the market for quite a long time, and so it was bought on a resale. And the police are standing guard in front of their house following incidents of rocks thrown into their picture window, cross burnings, mass arrests, and so forth. A Levittown neighbor of the Myers essentially made the point that I'm trying to make here, that it increased importance, that the increase in, increasing importance of property values to people whose major asset was now their homes intensified resistance to racial integration. And he made this point when he told a Life magazine reporter, and I quote, He's probably a nice guy, but every time I look at him, I see $2,000 drop off the value of my house." Unquote. This increasing segmentation of suburbia by class and race fueled even more damaging social inequality because of Americans' traditional uh, devotion to home rule as a critical pillar of democracy, a conviction which only intensified with suburbanization in the post-war period. And this is a reality that runs counter to a common assumption that it's the federal government that is the sort of key um, stage for government action in the post-World War II period. As a result of post-war Americans' loyalty to, lo loyalty to localism, the quality of crucial services soon varied much more than they formerly had when more people lived within the larger units of cross-class and interracial cities. Education, for example, widely recognized as the best ticket to success in post-war America, became captive to the inequalities of the new metropolitan landscape, since in the American system, local communities substantially provided and paid for their own schools through local property taxes. The wealthier the community, the more it had to spend, and the greater prospect of its children receiving the kind of educations that led them to prestigious colleges and graduate degrees and well-paying jobs. Essex County, uh, New Jersey fits this you know, overall. Uh, Essex County provides a particularly clear-cut case of how school spending per pupil, which is um, a, a fairly reliable proxy for educational quality, varied according to the socioeconomic profiles of post-war communities. The higher the median income, adult educational and job status, white presence in the population, home ownership rate and house value, and the lower the population density, all characteristics of wealthy suburbia, the greater the community's per, per pupil spending on schooling for its children. And most unfairly, the lower the local property tax rate its residents were assessed to pay for, for it. So for example, when Newark and Milburn are compared in these ways in 1960, they come out at opposite ends of the rankings. With Newark's per pupil expenditure only three quarters as high as Milburn's, despite the fact that its equalized tax rate based on the true market value of property was two and a third times higher. This inequality in school spending and property tax assessment has in fact led to intense battling in state supreme courts throughout the nation, everywhere from New Hampshire and Vermont to Texas and New Jersey, and many state supreme courts, including New Jersey's, have mandated equalizing school spending across communities in the state. And I think I hardly 
need remind you of the very historic uh, state Supreme Court decisions in New Jersey, Robinson v. Cahill and Abbott v. Burke, but um, this still goes on. The, these issues are still very much uh, with us today in New Jersey. Local, local property tax, at least the last time I looked, provided about 55% of the school costs in New Jersey in comparison to a national rate of about 42%. By putting its faith in the potential of the private mass consumption marketplace to deliver opportunity to all rather than, an expanding, pub, rather than expanding publicly funded rental housing or adopting policies that more effectively redistributed wealth and populations, the Consumers Republic contributed to growing inequality and fragmentation, both spatially and structurally. Despite an early commitment to selling to the mass, before very long, a post-war economy and society ostensibly built on mass consumption ironically created a reality of economic and social stratification. Residential suburbanization, the engineering of a social landscape to serve property values more effectively than broad human needs, became one of several arenas in post-war America where Americans shared less and less common physical space and civic culture. The segmentation of metropolitan areas was accompanied by the commercialization and privatization of public space. Initially, most post-war suburban home developers made very little effort to provide for residents' commercial needs. Rather, new suburbanites were expected to fend for themselves by driving to existing market towns, the old commercial centers uh, in New Jersey, which were often the only commerce for miles, uh, or to return to the major city like New York to shop. By the mid-1950s, however, a new market structure, the regional shopping center, well suited to this suburbanized, mass consumption-oriented society, emerged. Although it had precedence in the branch department stores and the prototypical uh, shopping centers that were constructed during the 1920s and the 1930s in outlying city neighborhoods and in older suburban communities, the new regional shopping center was on a much larger scale. Um, and in the absence or inadequacy of the existing town centers, it offered commercial developers a unique opportunity to reimagine community life with their private projects at its heart. What developed was a vision and a, soon a reality of suburban living where the center of community life was a site devoted to mass consumption. And what was promoted as public space was in fact privately owned and geared to maximizing profits. Now I've developed a case study in one of my chapters of two Paramus malls uh, which opened a mile apart in 1957. This is the Bergen Mall here uh, celebrating having a summer concert co which was called Music on the Mall. And it was just very typical of malls' efforts to legitimize themselves as the hub of suburban community life. Because remember, this was often, these were often fields, of farm fields or forests that had been uh, you know, taken down for uh, new homes. And they really weren't town centers. So uh, uh, malls like these became very key. And the other one, as you probably know, is the Garden State Plaza. Uh, and this is an aerial view. Its location here, typically at the intersection of major highways uh, or along busy uh, thoroughfares, attracting patrons they calculated from about a half an hour drives away. That that was part of the the, the the calculation. Customers would usually come by car. They would park in these abundant lots um, provided, and then they would proceed by by foot. Um, this is a, another view of the Garden State Plaza, and here you see that it was open air. The, the, the covering came much later, uh, landscaped, uh, it was, and it was really aimed at improving the pedestrian experience of downtown. Most shopping centers had two or three department stores serving as anchors, surrounded by 50 to 75 smaller stores. In the early years, when shopping centers were establishing their legitimacy as community centers, it was not uncommon for them to house services like post offices, banks, meeting and exhibition spaces, theaters, and even churches. Moreover, in selling themselves as improvements on the chaos, inefficiency, and ugliness of downtowns, shopping centers boasted that their centralized administrations determined the perfect mix and the scientific placement of stores. Greater shopper pleasure and storekeeper uh, store owner profitability were to inevitably follow, they, they, they argued. When developers and store owners set out to make the shopping center a more perfect downtown, 
they explicitly aim to exclude from this community space unwanted social groups, such as vagrants, racial minorities, political activists, people who are considered unruly youth, and poor people. They did so through a combination of marketing and policing. Location alone helped, for the suburbs where shopping centers were located were overwhelmingly white and middle class, and not easily reached by more diverse urban dwellers. Although buses served some shopping centers, only a tiny proportion of patrons arrived that way. And bus routes were carefully planned to transport non-driving customers, who were particularly women in these early days of suburbia, where often women didn't have their licenses, from neighboring suburbs, not low-income customers uh, from cities. In 1966, for example, the daily average of only, a daily average of only 600 people came to the Garden State Plaza by bus compared to a midweek daily average of 18,000 cars and a holiday peak of 31,000 cars, many carrying more than one passenger. Moreover, as developers sought sites close to the affluent um, populations to which they catered, their presence augmented the prosperity of host communities, exacerbating the already unequal distribution of economic resources in metropolitan areas. Not only did a suburban municipality with a shopping center find its residential property values increased by proximity to stores, but the presence of major commercial developments greatly enriched its tax base and, in turn, its core services like schools. And I'm going to show you here two images of um, JFK, of, of President Kennedy, um, uh, making appearances in northern New Jersey. This first one shows him. Uh, at Paramus's Bergen Mall in 1960, and you can see here he's addre addressing the kind of population that was attracted to that kind of setting of that commercial center, a uh, very white, middle-class audience. That's in 1960 when he's running for president, and the next one here is 1962 when he's in downtown Newark, and he's being enthusiastically welcomed by a very different crowd as Newark became increasingly black and Latino. Shopping centers also excluded unwanted elements through explicit market segmentation. Although individual department stores in a city center had long targeted particular markets defined by class and occasionally by race, some selling, for example, to the carriage trade at the upper end and others to the bargain hunters at the lower, shopping centers applied market segmentation on the scale of a downtown. At the start, all aimed at middle-income customers, and over time, they more and more targeted, differentiated, segmented publics, minimizing the opportunity for social mixing that had occurred on the city street, if not on a particular retail shop floor. Whereas at first, developers had, had sought to legitimize the new shopping centers by arguing for their centrality to commerce and community, over time, they discovered that those two com commitments could be in conflict. Uh, when anti-war protesters or striking employees noisily took their causes to the mall, respecting the rights of free speech and free assembly were not always good for business and could conflict with the rights of private property owners, the shopping centers, to control entry to their land. Beginning in the 1960s, American courts all the way to the state supreme, to the, to the U.S. Supreme Court, struggled with the political consequences of having moved public life off the street into the privately owned shopping center. The ultimate outcome was that the United States Supreme Court ruled that the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution did not guarantee free access to shopping centers, and it was left to the states to decide whether or not their own state constitution did. Only in six states, including New Jersey, and again the, US state, the New Jersey State Supreme Court was a leader in this, uh, have state Supreme Courts protected citizens' rights in privately owned shopping centers. And even in some of those states, New Jersey included, the, uh, the nature and timing of that activity have been limited. Meanwhile, as shopping centers began to reconsider the desirable balance between commerce and community in what had become the major sites where suburbanites congregated, they retreated from housing public services and whenever possible they banned or aggressively discouraged undesirables, such as young people who were considered loiterers, striking employees, leafleting and signature collecting political activists, and any individual whose appearance was deemed menacing or unprofitable. The shopping centers of the 1950s and the 1960s also contributed 
to a new calibration of consumer authority in the household between men and women that in many ways limited women's power over the family purse. In some ways, the physical space of shopping centers was designed for women shoppers, ranging from extra wide parking spots that were built for the new female drivers, uh, to interiors with stroller ramps, babysitting services, and special lockers for ladies' wraps. I wouldn't know how to design for a man, admitted Jack Follett of John Graham Inc., a company that built many shopping centers. But for all the attention that shopping centers supposedly lavished on women, when women consumers, they did little to enhance their social and economic power. Rather, as mass consumption became more and more central to the health of the economy, shopping centers and the stores within them celebrated the family as a consumer unit and paid increasing attention to men as the chief breadwinner. And you saw that in the man and his economy. And, and his economy. Um, Women may have orchestrated their family shopping, but marketing research documented over and over again that other family members, particularly decision-making uh, husbands, increasingly accompanied them on buying expeditions. As the manager of a toy store in a shopping uh, center in Massachusetts explained in 1953, quote, it's a curious thing about a shopping center. And he had had a store downtown as well, so he was making a comparison. Most of our daytime shoppers are women who are just looking around. It's hard to sell to them during the day, but if they're at all interested, they'll be back at night with their husbands. That's when we do the real business. And this is uh, here from Ma Macy's annual report in 1957, the year that the Garden State Plaza opened with its flagship store being Bamberger's, which you all know is, was, was Macy's pr store in New Jersey. And if, if you could read this, it would, you would notice it talks about the, the togetherness of family shopping. And this here is um, a page from the Department of Labor's publication, How American Buying Habits Changed, which came out in 1959. I draw your attention to the bottom, which uh, illustrates what marketers were increasingly calling the male-female dyad, uh, where men and women will purchase things together, men having great responsibility over expensive items, but even present in something as daily as uh, food shopping. Men's increased involvement in family purchasing was reinforced by the huge expansion of credit that shopping centers encouraged, making credit cards and other forms of credit the legal tender of mall purchasing. Until the passage of equal credit legislation in the 1970s, the growing importance of credit deepened men's oversight of the spending of their wives and daughters, as male names and credit ratings were required for female purchasing. Finally, shopping centers put limits on women's independence as workers, not just consumers. As suburban stores came to depend on part-time female sales help living nearby, whom they compensated with very low pay and few benefits. Not only did suburban housewives offer cheap and flexible labor, but their hiring helped branch department stores undermine the retail clerks unions that had successfully organized the main stores downtown show you here. This is the um, Bamberger's department store employee handbook in 1957 when the store opened. And I want you just to see the different expectations for men and women. So it's welcome to new friends for women. You're going to work to make friends and a new career when they're uh, showing men. Were this restructuring of public space only a phenomenon of post-war American suburbs, as fast as they were growing and as troubling as that might be, it would be one thing. What has magnified the problem, however, is that city leaders have coped with population decline, the flight of retail trade, and the public's fear for its safety on increasingly unfamiliar urban streets by trying to beat the suburbs at their own game, by modeling the renovation of urban public space on the suburban model making downtowns, too, more commercialized and privatized. And uh, to make this point, um, uh, I, I want to show you um, here, uh, this is just a, to make the point first that, uh, how, that in fact, uh, cities like Hackensack suffered terribly from uh, the, the malls that were built. Here you see, uh, per capita annual retail sales, 1939 to 67, Paramus and Hackensack. And you can see what happens when the, um, the Hackensack is obviously very static, if not, you know, starting to fall as Paramus uh, climbs. And there are many ways of, of measuring that. 
Over the last half century, hardly an American city has avoided the mollification of downtown, with pedestrian malls and festival marketplaces cut off from city traffic, and enclosed shopping centers entered directly through parking garages. For those shoppers and workers who still venture downtown, the city increasingly resembles a suburban mall, offering them in their private cars direct access to privately owned and policed, usually commercial spaces, and passages out without entry onto city streets. As a Catholic priest and community activist described downtown Newark in 1997, admittedly one of the most extreme cases, quote, prime office space is that with garage parking. And they are all built like fortresses, with their lobbies up on the second floor and retail space in atriums and courts. It's not very pedestrian friendly and inviting. The result is you have two cities downtown, the one in around the offices and the one on the streets where the people are. And to illustrate this, this very common pattern um, over the post-war period, I'm going to show you two posters that were uh, made of an imaginary city that's supposed to be emblematic of a very typical uh, post-war experience. Uh, they were they're of a, something that was called New Providence America, and they were developed by something called the Townscape Institute of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they show you, I'm going to show you, this is the town square in 1935. Um, and you know you see the, the main department store and the what the town square looks like and you see the the, the, the trolley going through and uh, it seems to be pretty prosperous and people are hanging out on the square and this is 1970 and the department store is in trouble the parking has been turned into more of a suburban type type uh, parking they've mauled it over there's not the public transportation are going through they've created this sort of pedestrian mall instead of the common um, and the only people you see is a person being mugged over there. Urban downtowns thus have mimicked the suburbs increasing privatization of public space blurring the lines between what is public and private, civic and commercial and infringing on individual civil rights. For example in Stamford, Connecticut a Starbucks coffee shop recently opened in the city's public library modeled after the increasingly ubiquitous cafe bookstores like Borders and Barnes and Noble fulfilling its vice president's promise that by opening a new store, store a Starbucks every 40 hours quote we are the third place in your community the proliferation of private cell phones makes public telephones fewer in number and higher in cost self-taxing private business improvement districts perform more and more of the work that public agencies once did cleaning policing and upgrading neighborhoods and they do so free of the municipal oversight and public accountability that protects the rights of all citizens in those spaces. Moreover, and this is quite an amazing statistic, I think, more and more Americans estimated at one in six now live under the private police protection and private services of gated or other kinds of association managed communities such as condominiums or cooperatives. With market standards defining success in more and more spheres of American life, becomes harder and harder to defend the public if it is viewed as coming at the cost of profits, flexibility, efficiency, or technological progress. What endangers public space is nothing less than what endangers all of society when the test of value becomes limited to market visibility and viability. Even the notion of public government itself is at risk. More than 10 years ago, the Clinton-Gore National Performance Review Report aimed at reinventing government which was entitled From Red Tape to Results, Creating a Government that Works Better and Costs Less, that was released in 1993, drew its inspiration from the private um, uh, transaction of retailer and customer. And I quote, effective entrepreneurial governments insist on customer satisfaction. They listen carefully to their customers using surveys, focus groups, and the like. They restructure their basic operations to meet customers' needs. And they use market dynamics, such as competition and customer service, to create incentives that drive their employees to put customers first. And needless to say, these private market models for government have only grown over the last decade. During the last half century, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here, Americans' confidence that an economy and a culture built around mass consumption could best deliver greater democracy and equality has led us from the consumer's republic to what I call the consumerization of the republic. Advocates first for the post-war suburb, then the city, and increasingly the nation itself, have all come to judge the success of the public realm 
much like other purchase goods and commercial transactions, by the personal benefit that individual citizen consumers derive from it. When Americans in the 21st century ask of the public domain, am I getting my money's worth, rather than what's best for America, they knowingly are not speaking an idiom that evolved out of the misguided conviction, I would argue, of the consumer's republic that dynamic, unrestrained public markets could, could enhance affluence and democracy at the very same time. Thank you.